They were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And in the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all those who are speaking Galatians? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamis, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and Protestants. Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's death power. All we were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with the new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who lived in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what we, was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. And in all those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portion, port, portents in the heaven, above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord, great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. This is the start of the church as we know it. Clearly a big God moment. <clears throat> Tremendous display of God's power. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about displays of God's power and from some, from some pretty different points of view. But let me start out by saying prophecy sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Until it comes true. We all want to believe in the power of a transcendent God, this God that can do amazing and wonderful things. We want to believe it exists, that it's there. But when we see that power, do we believe or do we become skeptical? Today we're going to take a look at prophecy. We're going to take a look at the coming of God and we're going to take a look at our reaction and ask, are we ready? Let us begin a prayer. Gracious and almighty God, we open your word today to see how your spirit has come and fall upon your church, upon your people, and how you created monumental change. Help us to see a little bit more clearly today who you are, where you've been, and where you're going. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It occurs to me as I was reading this passage, we got to be careful what we ask for. Anybody ever tell you you need to be careful what you ask for, you just might get it? What is it that we are asking for here at Geneva, as a church? What are we hoping for? When I ask this question, I'm asking it in a sense of if we truly say, come Lord Jesus, come, come Holy Spirit, follow us, what are we asking for? 
What is it that we hope will happen if the Holy Spirit comes here today? What's going to happen? What is it that you would like the Holy Spirit to do? Would you like the Holy Spirit to revive the church? Yes. <laughs> if the Holy Spirit came today, would you hope the Holy Spirit would revive the church? Would you hope that the Holy Spirit would come and make the church great again? <clears throat> Do we hope that for this because we don't want to see the church die? Do we hope for this because we want to see other people know God as we know God? Do we hope for this because we want to see life come back to what it used to be? And know how good it once was. And then some. And then some. But there's something we need to be aware of. Long ago, before the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, Amos came and he preached a sermon up in Israel, and he warned that the day of the Lord, the day that they were all looking forward to, the day they knew God was going to come back to Israel, Amos warned the day of the Lord is not this great day you're hoping for. The day of the Lord is going to be a day of sorrow. A frustration, a gnashing of teeth. Amos warned that it wasn't exactly what they were hoping for, what they wanted, that they needed to be careful of what they asked for because they just might get it. The people knew that God had promised he would come back. The people were waiting for that. They knew when God came back, they would be great again as they were under King David and King Solomon. And, I, and Amos was saying, it might not be what you think it will be. <laughs> Today we pray, come Holy Spirit, come. And we need to be careful. Because the Holy Spirit might just come. And then what? What would change if the Holy Spirit came here today? What changes in my life and in your life? What would God think of the world that we have created today? What would he think of our politics? And this is where it gets really easy for a preacher because you know you have one side of your, your congregation that's going to say, oh yeah, and the other side of your congregation, congregation is going to go, oh yeah. And, and really, if we're honest, will God be happy with either side? Will God be happy with the way that we live? Are we living as God has called us to? Are we acting in the ways that show God's love as God wants us to show it. Will God be happy with the way that we love? Will God come and say, y'all are doing a fantastic job. By the way, you know God's Southern, right? <laughs> will God come and say, y'all are doing a fantastic job, or will he say, we can do better? My fear is that we think we've done something really good. And truthfully, we can look at all the things that we do, and we can say, we do these things, and we do them well. We can be proud of how we serve other people, and how we look out for those who are less fortunate, how we raise up our kids, how we create programs in our church for people of all ages. We can be happy with what we've done. And we think we've done something great. But have we fooled ourselves? My fear is, is that I think that we might be helplessly misdirected. We might be living in our hope that what we've done is good. Good enough. Truthfully, we fight over the silliest of things. We make demands that, aren't, that are not really appropriate for God's kingdom. We limit who comes to the table. In many ways, we find ways in which we miss the mark. We don't see it. We don't know it. We miss that. My fear is when God comes, those things which we aren't doing well will become strikingly clear. How ready are we to address those things? How ready are we for God to come and say, good job, but you need to do more? How open are we to being told that we need to do better? How open are we to being willing to do better? How many here 
are tired? How many here are frustrated? How many here are ready to be working with more? To be sent out to do more? So what is it that we need to do? As we look at Pentecost, as we look at the spirit that fell upon the disciples and led them to preach so that everybody could hear, starting the church as we know it today, what is it that we need to be willing to do? The first thing we have to do is we have to bring all that we have, all that we believe, all that we hold on to, and we have to put it on the altar. We can be proud of ourselves, but put it on the altar to be examined. We can say we're doing great, but put it on the altar to be examined. When I started school back in 2004, I was 34 years old and had enough time in my life to come to some pretty concrete understandings of what I believed and what I thought I knew. Probably nothing more strong than a young 20-year-old who knows everything. Some of you have grandkids that are there right now. Some of you have kids that are there right now. You know what I'm talking about. We might have forgotten what it was like for us when we knew everything. But at 34, I was still in that phase where I thought I had a bull by the tail. Yeah. A bull by the horse, tiger by the tail. That's what it was. <laughs> and I got to school, I got to, to uh, undergraduate studies, and I decided, somebody had told me something that I needed to be willing to challenge everything, and I decided I was going to do just that. And I put all that I believed, all my politics, all of my theology, I put it on the altar. And my thought was, I'll put it up there, and if it holds up, if I can examine it and challenge it, and if it holds up to scrutiny, then I keep it. And if it doesn't, I change it. And if it falls apart, I get rid of it. That's hard to do. That's very hard to do. And I had to put it up there with humility to say, okay, how do I need to change? We have to be willing to put what we believe on the altar. Some of us having a lifetime of creative theologies and understandings that has to be put on the altar. And we have to ask, is this what God is asking us to believe, to do, to feel? Do I need to change? Now, we might think that that's a bit extreme. You might say, you know what? I've lived my whole life as a Christian. I know I got it. I'm on there. I'm good. Let me challenge you for a minute. Jesus came, Emmanuel, God with us, and walked on the earth, and walked among the religious leaders of the day. We look back at the Pharisees, and we have our ideas of who the Pharisees were and what kind of men they were, right? We tend to think maybe those Pharisees got it all wrong. The problem is those Pharisees were the people who spent their whole life studying. They studied because they loved God. These aren't men who didn't love God and wanted to see everybody crumble and just they wanted the power. These, we have to believe, many of them loved God, devoted their lives to the, to the study of God, to the understanding of, of God's scriptures, looking forward to God's promises. They weren't evil people, at least not by choice. Misled, yes. Evil, no. Pharisees were good people. So do you think if Jesus walked into our sanctuary today that you would be able to know that was him? That you would have no doubt and he would walk in and you would say, that's Jesus? I'm absolutely certain that the Pharisees thought the same thing about God and the coming Messiah. That when the Messiah came, the Pharisees could say, that's him. That's our promise, living here today. But they missed the mark. They missed the opportunity. Scriptures tell us that one day we will be fully known just as we have been fully known. Now, I know there's a couple ways we can understand that, but what if that means that when we get to heaven, we're going to fully know the events of our lives and those opportunities we had and the people that we ran into? If that's the case with the Pharisees, when they went to the next life, did they know at that moment that that was Jesus and they missed the mark? What day would that be like? You and I might think we recognize God, but we might be fooling ourselves. So how is it that we keep from fooling ourselves? How is it that we engage in the work that God has called us to? How is it that we move into a relationship with God where we don't fool ourselves, where we actually develop a good and faithful relationship with God? If that's what we truly seek, 
And what we truly need to seek is the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, we know the difference between God's coming and our own strong desires. We know the differences between God's truth and what we want to be true. It is not Satan that we got to worry most about. Who was the uh, who was the comedian that always said, "Devil made me do it." Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson. <laughs> Devil made me do it. I believe that we ourselves are most dangerous, that evil within is greater than the evil without. When we say, come Holy Spirit, come, we need to be careful. First, we need to make sure that we truly are seeking God and not ourselves. Then, we need to be ready to be called to make tremendous change. That day, that Pentecost day, when the Disciples all wore their red. <laughs> he came out and preached. That day when the Spirit fell and the flame touched upon the top of their head and they spoke and everybody understood, their lives changed tremendously. It was never the same again. It wasn't easy either. The disciples went through change that we can only imagine. Now, if the Holy Spirit were to come again today and, and the power that the Holy Spirit came then, we might not see tongues of flame and we might not have the voice to speak, but something is going to happen. It's going to be different. We will be called to change. I'm certain that how we live life today is not really how God wants us to live life. We will be called to change our attitudes, our beliefs, our practices, our values. I'm not saying that what we have right now is all wrong. I'm just saying it's not all right. And there will be change. Even though we strive today to live as Christians, we still have change to make. And if the Holy Spirit of God falls upon us, we will be led to deeper and, and, and profound changes. But what a glorious day that will be. Are you truly ready to ask, come Holy Spirit, come? To implore God to remember us? Are you ready to truly accept how that coming will transform us today? What a glorious day that will be. Please let it be today. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, with boldness, we do come and say, Come, Holy Spirit. Just as you did of old, let your Spirit fall upon us, God. Use us. Change us. So that we might change this world, that the world would come to know you in new and powerful, profound ways. Come into your church, God. Revive us again to be used to be change agents, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing our final hymn?
celebrating a birthday. Judy, it's good to have you with us here. We look forward to celebrating with you. Everybody is invited to Becker Hall for that celebration. If you're ready, pray, come Holy Spirit, come. It's not only where you come and meet God and you go to God, but this is the opportunity where God comes and falls upon you. Pray, Holy Spirit, come. Now go out. Love and serve the Lord through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit. Amen.